we have most of our, well, three of our five au pairs here. Cece's first day, which I texted to her mom. Tekla and Dash in Central Park. Sophie in Mexico. Rebecca at the- We've all heard of au pairs. They're young women and sometimes men who've helped raise middle to upper middle class families for decades. In return, they've learned about American culture and hopefully improved their English. You are my favorite little boy. <laughs> Deliver newspaper hurts you. Every year, roughly 20,000 au pairs between the ages of 18 and 26 come to the United States. Unless you've gone through it before, it's really hard to relate to being on someone else's schedule, to watching their kids, living with them in their home, having them buy your food and be in control of very private and intimate aspects of your life. I, like many host parents, went to the au pair option because I needed flexible childcare that I could afford. And what I discovered was that I think that I and my husband, we learned how to be better parents. Everybody you have to read now, okay? Compared to other in-home childcare options available in the U.S., au pairs are relatively cheap. And if you die, then we While a nanny costs between $15 and $20 per hour for one child, an au pair can make as little as $4.35. And that's no matter how many children she cares for. That is over full time. This is a full-fledged labor program. The federal program has been under scrutiny since its inception. Low wages, exploitation, and lack of oversight have long been challenged by government officials, activists, and lawsuits. How do you make sure that you're keeping in mind the fact that this is not a domestic worker relationship or a transaction, it is a cultural experience. That is a burden on the agencies to make sure that there is consistent communication and education about how to, how to do this as well as possible. Americans in general have no idea how to have um, domestic employees because there's this sort of whiff of elitism about the idea that you're going to be paying $25,000 or $30,000 a year to have somebody live in your home with you for a year and take care of your kids 40 to 45 hours a week. Somehow it's elitism to try and find affordable childcare. At a time of rising childcare prices, how come au pairs cost $4.35 per hour? You guys want to eat here or over there? Yeah. Can eat. Here. here. All right. Where did you put it? This is Sarah Larson. Sarah and her family moved from Manhattan to the suburbs about five years ago. That's also when they transitioned from a nanny to an au pair. So that you could pick up Shane, Dash, and Seb. If we were to have looked into a nanny up here, I think the talent pool is um, much smaller, and we probably would have had to compromise on quality of childcare as well as the inconvenience of a commute from where most of the nanny population, from what I understood, lived. And the lack of flexibility and the cost were things that precluded us from really seriously considering a nanny. And the opportunity to welcome someone into our homes and have a cultural experience and a vignette into another country for a year for our children has been incredibly um, exciting and great for the growth of our family. It's such an American, like, gluttonous Some holiday. people start doing it. Cecilia Erbsnagel is from Denmark. She joined the Larsons in January 2019. Well, it actually goes way back when my uncle, who is seven years older than me, his girlfriend decided to become an au pair. And I was, what, only 14 or something like that? So since then, I've always wanted to be it. And I go to America, explore, yeah, and visit. The word au pair comes from French and means on par or on equal terms. It was meant to destigmatize the traditional domestic worker employer relationship. The difference between a more traditional in home caregiver, such as a nanny, and an au pair is that nannies are often women who live in the country already and have made it their career to care for children. Au pairs, on the other hand, are young foreigners on a temporary visa, often taking a gap year between studies or a completely different profession. The au pair program gained popularity after World War II and was formalized by the Council of Europe in 1969. In 1986, it arrived to the U.S., first under the United States Information Agency. It later joined the State Department under its J-1 Visa Exchange Visitor Program. The program proved hugely popular as the two-income family home was growing rapidly. 
from 1950 to 1985, workforce participation of married women with children under the age of six grew nearly five times. There was a huge shortage of legal nannies, and for those that could find and afford one, it was twice as expensive. Janie Chuang is a professor at American University Law School. In 2012, she authored The U.S. Au Pair Program, Labor Exploitation and the Myth of Cultural Exchange. If you've got a family who has five kids, you know, compare that to sending them to a preschool, <laughs> right? $20,000 a kid versus paying $10,000 um, a year out of pocket for childcare for five kids. It's, it's a no-brainer economically to just hire an au pair. The main thing to know is that au pairs are cultural exchange students. They are not professional nannies. So au pairs and host families have to abide by strict U.S. State Department regulations. Jennifer Yoel is a local child care coordinator, or LCC, in Westchester County, New York. She works for Cultural Care Au Pair, the largest au pair agency in America. So we are on our way to the Radis family. Uh, they've been on the program for years, and uh, they are extending with their Brazilian au pair, Monica. I think that was actually Monica, the au pair, <laughs> waiting at the bus stop. As an LCC, Jennifer spends most of her days making sure host families and the au pairs are happy and following the rules. Hi, how are you? Good, nice to see you. How's everything? Good. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the State Department regulations are. Um, so you can uh, take care of the children uh, for no more than 10 hours a day and up to 45 hours per week. And she Cultural Care Au Pair, which is Jennifer's employer, is one of the 16 non- and for-profit companies contracted by the Department of State to run the au pair program. These companies handle everything from visas, oversight, training, and matching of host families with potential au pairs. The State Department obviously processes the visas, but other than that, the agency really only sets the laws and regulations, many of which have been up for interpretation. Um, she is going to get a minimum weekly stipend of $195.75, and that shouldn't be withheld um, for any reason. And again, you know, she can't get paid extra money for, for working any longer. Um, do you have any questions about... The weekly stipend Jennifer is referring to was set by the sponsor agencies based on the federal minimum wage of $7.25. 40 percent is subtracted for room and board, which makes the weekly cash stipend $195.75. The host family is also obligated to pay $500 towards education. Mm -hmm. Do you dream in English, Monica? Did you start dreaming in English? This is always... I mean, like, no. I bet it's going to happen. It will happen. It will, it will happen. It will happen. So just know with the, with the classes, um, you'll be responsible for up to $500 of her six credits and making sure that she can get transportation, whether she uses yeah. the car or has transportation there. To join the program, host families pay the sponsor agency okay. around $8,000 up front. Like About 3000 of that is used to process visas, travel, and other fees, and the rest goes to the company. Au pairs also pay agencies a recruitment fee. Depending on the agency, that ranges from $500 to $3,000. When we talk about an au pair's compensation, there are three pieces of that compensation. The first part is the weekly stipend. Then there's room and board, which in a lot of places, like the New York City area, is worth way more. Um, and then the third part is the incidental and intangible compensation. So it's things like cell phones, use of a family car, car insurance, education credit, transportation to and from your classes, two weeks of vacation, various vacation days, somebody's doing your laundry, someone's taking you out to dinner, sometimes you go on family vacation, somebody's listening to you talk about your breakup with your partner, um, somebody's hosting your friends at their house while you make them all dinner. So there's also that compensation. The public perception of au pairs is generally positive. Still, the federal program has been criticized for a long time. A year into the program, in 1987, an interagency review panel concluded that the educational and cultural components could only be fulfilled if the work week was reduced to 30 hours. 
but the American sponsor agencies disagreed and Congress ordered the program to continue. A few years later, in 1990, and then again in 2012, reports by the Congressional Watchdog, the General Accounting Office, stated that the au pair program was not compatible with the original intent and should therefore be moved to the Department of Labor. The idea that the au pair program is a cultural exchange program is in some sense a fiction. It really is a guest worker program, and it should be treated as such with labor protections afforded to those who participate in it. That is not the fault of the au pair program, and that is not the fault of the host parents, and that is not the fault of the au pairs themselves. That's a setup by the U.S. government. And I don't think you're going to find any energy in the United States government to address this problem. In July 2019, the program faced its most public controversy. Twelve former au pairs settled a $65 million class action lawsuit in Colorado against the 15 of the 16 sponsor agencies. The sponsor agencies did not admit to wrongdoing, but 100,000 former au pairs who came to the U.S. between 2009 and 2018 could be paid about $3,500 each. The lawsuit argued that the sponsor agencies illegally colluded in price fixing and set the weekly stipend below minimum wage, ignored overtime and state minimum wage laws. It also alleged that the companies ignored abuses within the program, such as families overworking or asking au pairs to do more than their duties. That was not resolved in the settlement. But moving forward, sponsor agencies cannot advertise a fixed wage, encouraging host families and au pairs to potentially negotiate. It's still unclear how that will work in reality. If there is an expectation that they have to do some negotiating with the family that they've never met and that they're coming to spend a year with, that is not a good starting point for the family dynamic. So I think as it relates to the lawsuit itself, as any program will have, there will be, um, I don't want to call them bad apples, but there will be unfortunate circumstances and that is a burden on the agencies because there is um, very little structure around making sure that the au pairs are, are, are well protected. Like conversation about like negotiating what I should get paid, it's not really the best start, I would say, to talk with the family. Like this should be about getting to know the family, but I wouldn't feel comfortable negotiating it. In Europe, au pairs work generally 25 to 30 hours per week and can negotiate salaries. Edwina Koch and her partner Hannah Watkin started Au Pair Au Paris, an online platform to help au pairs navigate the many ups and downs of their year abroad. Au pairs are young women who this might be their very first job. They don't know how to balance that line between having someone as a boss, but they're also your host parent. So they don't want to step over set boundaries. And they're also in a totally different world, are dealing with different cultural aspects. It can be quite intimidating and scary. Ultimately, the existing problems with the au pair program are emblematic of a broader problem. As we've reported before, cost of childcare in America has tripled since 1990, and families spend anything from 8 to 15 percent of their total income on childcare. Single parent families can spend more than 60 percent in states like Massachusetts. The au pair program, it's great that there's been exposure to uh, the problems within that program, but if we're going to take care seriously, we'll have to think broader in terms of creating programs that bring workers in or recognize the work that's already being done here in the United States to provide care to our children, our elderly, our disabled. We have uh, an entire culture that claims to care about children and does very little for them. We claim to care about mothers and families. We do very little for them. No change to the au pair program is going to resolve those tensions. But we can talk about the au pair program as a way to talk about those tensions without talking about them. Based on the latest lawsuit, it's unclear if the government or the sponsor agencies will make any lasting changes to the program. While stakeholders wait for that, 20,000 some au pairs will enter the country every year, many leaving feeling like they got what they wanted from the program. My goal was like get a better English, like improve my English. 
and just live the experience. I loved my experience. I love sharing my story. I love encouraging people to become au pairs. It's a great way to share two cultures. You come to a country, you leave everything behind at home that is safe for you, to come from your safe place and come to a family you know like very little about. This experience has been so good so far. I've become a stronger person.